I thought so. This is uh, a study in uh, Richard Borkham's book, Jesus and the Eyewitness Accounts. Now, I, I, I agree with most of what Borkham's saying. I don't agree with all of it, but I, I agree with his general thesis. Um, but what I just want to do now is I, I want to play devil's advocate and I want to play the role of someone coming and taking on Borkham and criti critiquing him and one of the areas that we can critique him now is when he's trying to prove his point that w we should take the Gospels as serious eyewitness material because the living voice of investigating eyewitnesses that ancient h Greek historians did is the same as say papyrus which shows uh, a uniformity of looking at eyewitness material from the Greeks right through to the right end of the Gospels up to papyrus. I noticed a problem with that in that if we look at papyrus he's not consistent completely about who wrote the Gospels. He talks about Matthew wrote Matthew and Mark wrote Mark but John the Elder wrote John which general tradition has it that the Apostle John wrote it so a, a historian who's trying to get eyewitness material he's got his facts wrong so we need to um, think about that just for a second so we're going to think about the Gospel of John although there are several earlier documents both within the Orthodox stream and within Gnosticism that allude to the false gospel are quoted. See the discussion below. The first writer to quote unambiguously from the fourth gospel and to ascribe the work of John is Theophilus of Antioch, AD 181. Before this date, however, several writers, including uh, Tatian, a student of Justin Martyr, Claudius, Ap Apollinarius, Bishop of Heraclius, Athenagoras, but ambiguously quotes from the fourth gospel as from as a form an authoritative source. This pushes us back to Polycarp and Papias, information about whom derives primarily from Irenaeus, end of the second century, and Eusebius, the historian of the early church, fourth century. Polycarp was martyred in 156 at the age of 86. There is no reason, therefore, to deny the truth of the claim that he associated with the apostles in Asia, John, Andrew and Philip, who was entrusted with the oversight of the church in Smyrna by those who were eyewitnesses of, and ministers of the Lord. Irenaeus knew Polycarp personally, but it's Polycarp who mediates to us the most important information about the false gospel. Writing to Florinus, Irenaeus recalls, I remember the events of those days most clearly than those who had have happened recently for what we learn as children grows up with the soul and becomes united to it so I can speak even of the place in which the blessed Polycarp sat and disputed how he came in and went out the character of his life the appearance of his body the discourse which he made to the people how he, how he reported his converse with John and with the others who had seen the Lord how he remembered their words and what were the things concerning the Lord which he had heard from them including his miracles and teachings and how Polycarp had received them from the eyewitnesses of the word of the Lord and reported all things in agreement with the scriptures most scholars recognize that this John certainly refers to John the Apostle the son of Zebedee is for Irenaeus his concern none other than John whom he emphatically insists is the fourth evangelist Irenaeus that the gospel should be fourfold in the sense already described was as natural as there should have been four winds as for the four gospels he wrote John the disciple of the Lord who leaned back on his breast published the gospel while he was resident at Ephesus in Asia in other words the name of the fourth evangelist is John and is to be identified with the beloved disciple of John 1323. I've got it. I don't think Papias was actually wrong about talking about um, John the Elder. Okay. I think 
that Eusebius didn't like and he, he states that clearly in the text when he's commentating about uh, papyrus he didn't like the end time teaching the millennial reign and all the rest of it that papyrus was 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 stated um, and so therefore I think he's trying to muddy the waters and he's trying to put an emphasis on papyrus was actually confused and, and, and got his ideas from John the Elder and not John the Apostle so I think that's why the confusion is there um, on that on that score so in other words Barkham's um, theory is intact yes people can get things wrong historians can get things wrong they can get facts wrong but if they're trying to be honest they do get us if we get to the eyewitness material it does give us access to something unique in that event um, if we prove it's eyewitness material then then what that means is that we have to think about whether it's credible whether it's consistent whether there are other testimonies, whether the background verifies what they're saying. However, I think presuppositions do play a part. Because if someone came to me and said, I've just investigated testimonies of people seeing UFOs in the 1950s. I wouldn't take any of that testimony seriously because the probability of I of of alien ships coming down to the to the to um to the UK uh, not to the UK but to to the earth the probability of that is it's not even one out of one hundred it's not even it's just it's beyond impossible when we're talking about billions of galaxies and billions of stars in each galaxy and we we can't see life anywhere it, it's just an impossibility so if someone starts saying to me there are um, UFOs and eyewitness sightings and I look at I, before I even look at the evidence to me it's just not a possibility I will look at the evidence I will try and be fair but at the back of my mind I'm thinking it just seems improbable to me and so presuppositions play a, a role it's reasonable to consider these person's testimonies in the Gospels because of the God of the Gospels the God who created everything if he created everything it's not unreasonable that he could bring someone from the dead and that as a presupposition means that when you're looking at the evidence you're going to be more predisposed to look at it favorably if it seems to be consistent So I think that no matter no matter how fair and honest you are as a historian, whether you're uh, an atheist or a skeptic or agnostic, 
if you don't believe there is a God then no matter how much testimony you investigate you're never really going to come to faith and to believe in Jesus as, as dying minds you have to there has to be a point where the presupposition that God exists is part of your historical inquiry because at the end of the day if you don't believe there's a God even if you've got all the dots tilted and you say well Jesus uh, it was seen by these disciples etc and you've got that then that still leaves you there it doesn't move you into um, a belief that there is a God or that God rose Jesus from the dead I mean you can excuse me you can put uh, causes effects and causes in the equation how did how come the gospel Jesus resurrection uh, changed the apostle Paul how come the enemies of Jesus uh, didn't provide the body to put out the Christian faith you can provide all these cause and effects and gives you a strong pro probability that Christ rose from the dead but ultimately if you don't believe there's a God you won't grant that evidence as being significant to the proving of, of Jesus' ministry you would just say well if he said he was going to die and he rise again and he died and he rose again it was just coincidence it doesn't necessarily prove that it was a supernatural event But what the test, but what Volker's project does do is it is it 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 puts it more on the table that these things did happen, that they the disciples did see these miracles, they did see Jesus rise from the dead. But what we make of it as moderns as skeptics, I mean I'm not a skeptic, but if you are a skeptic, then that's a different matter. But it means that we're getting closer to the historical event. So I think what it means is when we're defending the resurrection of Christ or the life of Christ that we have to challenge the skeptic not only on the objective historical information I uh, and when I say objective that means that we do come at, come at it with a bias so we have to challenge people's bias and show ask them why they are coming to the material in an, in a fair objective way so we challenge your methodology, we challenge challenge them on their interpretate understanding of the facts and the interpretation of the historical Jesus. But it also we have to challenge presuppositions. We have to go into an argument uh, of does God exist or not? Before we even get to the historical evidence, I think. That's my reflection so far on Borkham. It's a very powerful tool. Uh, it's it it backs up the Christian faith, strengthens the Christian faith. But I'm just qualifying it as to how we can basically how you use all this in a practical form quickly. It's basically you say to people, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. And they say, well, that's just your opinion. And you can say, well, I can provide you evidence, eyewitness material. And you provide the fact that you go into all the historical reasons why the Gospels are eyewitness material from ancient historians and the way they wrote. Then they might say, well, they might have got it wrong. And you say, well, um, the evidence is against that because there's so much eyewitness material here to, to offset any any possibility of that. But then they'll say, well, yeah, but even if they saw a resurrected Jesus, still doesn't mean we have to believe it, doesn't prove it. And then you can say, well, do you believe there's a God? And say, no, and you, you give some arguments for that. And you say, well, this God created us in his image and he rose 
and and it says that he was going to raise Christ and he, he's risen Christ and if you believe the interpretation of this God and the scriptures then you know that's one way of looking at it that Christ did rise from the dead and it explains X Y Z it explains the evidence it explains the reason why you're here etc hi folks this is Jason we have just been looking at Borkham's book on the um, historical Jesus studies concerning uh, Jesus and eyewitness material and there are four seminal lectures that Borkham has done uh, he's done these four lectures at Southern Theological Seminary um, if you go to Southern uh, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary uh, principal is Al Muller and just type into YouTube uh, Barcom and History of the Gospels and you'll get some of the lectures there's four of them uh, Borkham in the first lecture uh, talks about that generally modern scholarship regarded the four gospels as not uh, ancient history uh, but there were some studies done by Richard Barrages uh, Bar on Greek biography and Samuel Bisco and scholars began to see that the way ancient writers wrote and they began to see certain methodologies within the writing such as um, these ancient biographies and histories often would have a prologue um, they would have uh, sections having various um, material that fit into themes in their biography etc um, he found that the structure of these biographies and histories was, op was often uh, flexible these biographies uh, and histories were, were either political um, they were either intellectual biographies or about holy men um, contemporary accounts of these people were was esteemed uh, for historical inquiry they wanted as historians, historians to just get inside um, the meaning and, and an understanding of the historical event they were inquiring into they wanted the facts, they engaged in interpretation and it was because of this understanding of ancient writing that it dawned on people well the gospels were written at, at, in that millennial in that, in that intellectual ferment and culture of how they understood biography and history and they began to apply those tools that they looked to ancient writers Roman historians and Greek historians and they began to apply it to the Gospels and it then caused a sea change where the scholarly world began to realize actually the Gospels were more historically reliable and were written as a, a genre of, of uh, biography rooted in, in history um, so we'll leave it there and we'll have one more video so we're looking at uh, Richard Borkham's book uh, Jesus and the Eyewitness uh, the Gospels as Eyewitness Testimony Richard Borkham 2006 Erdna and we've looked at quite a bit about Papias we looked at um, the difference between oral tradition and oral historians and we need to just think about Papias again in page 14 uh, Borkham writes about Papias this makes the particular passage from Papias very precious evidence of the way in which the gospel traditions were understood to be related to the eyewitness at, 
um, at the very time when the other at the very time when the canonical gospels were being written the canonical, canonical gospels were being written so the fact that papyrus saw the living voice the interviewing of individual eyewitnesses as vital um, is strong evidence to suggest that the gospels when they were being written also wanted to interview or look at it from the perspective of the living eyewitnesses of the time this historian the way um, Papias thought of history is the same as he thought as the same kind of history that Polybius thought and also um, the Sidites. Um, historians strict, strict principle of historiography were like those of the Sidites, something of an idea for later historians uh, which wanted to claim uh, a practice. So let, let's just uh, get some information about This is on a site called Ancient Greece. The city is, was a Greek historian who was born in Alamos between the year 460 and 455 BC and died between 411 and 4 BC. He is known for his book, The History of the Peloponnesian War, which details the war between Sparta and Athens in the 5th century. As with many authors of that time, much of the information we know about him comes from this, his sole work, where we gain our views of his personality and his thoughts. On the leaders of Athens. Thucydides was an Athenian aristocrat who was to believe that in his late twenties or early thirties when the war first broke out in 431 BC. Thucydides famously described to us the plague of Athens in 430 BC. This is on uh, Ancient History Source Book. Uh, there's a massive article um, which I'll link to it. Um, We'll just read a bit of this. Uh, Thucydides, Athenian historian, materials for his biography are scanty. The facts of interest chiefly are as aids to the appreciation of his, of his lab life's labour, the history of the Peloponnesian War. The older view that he was probably born in about 471 BC is based on a passage of Aulus uh, Gallius, who say that in 431 Hellenesius seems to have been uh, 65 years of age. Herodotus 53 and Thucydides 40. The authority of this statement was uh, Pamphila, a woman of Greek extraction who compiled bi biographic, biographical and historical notices in the reign of he Nero. The value of uh, testimony is negligible and modern criticism inclines to a later date, about 460. Thucydides' father, Olerus, a citizen of Athens, belonged to a family which derived wealth and influence with the profession possession of gold mines at Scat Tile on the Thracian coast opposite Thessal and was a relative of his elder namesake, the Thracian prince whose daughter uh, Hegespile married the great Metidides. So the Simon, son of 
Metius was possibly a connection of Thucydides. Um, so we'll, we'll just get um, Fordham University is a good uh, source. I'll, I'll 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 link to I'll link to um, Papias and uh, the cities the city these um, sources so that you can research yourself um, we'll just see The city is the Pen 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 Peloponnesian War on Historical Method. Um, the History of the Peloponnesian War by uh, the city is 460 to 500 BC is considered by many to be the first history without myths. It is the story of the war between Athens and its allies against Sparta, its allies which tore the Greek world in the 5th century. The city was an Athenian general, but when he was exiled for losing a battle, he began his history of the war. The following excerpt he describes his method of writing. He says, having now given the results, this is the Greek historian, having now given the results of my inquiries into early times, I grant that there will be a difficulty in believing every particular detail. The way that most men deal with traditions, even traditions of their own country, is to receive them all alike as they are delivered without applying any critical test whatsoever. The general Athenian public fancied that if Heracles was tyrant when he when he fell by the hands of Armadius and Aristogiton, not knowing that Happius, the eldest of the sons of the Pisistratus, was really supreme, and that Hipparchus and Thassalus were his brothers, and that Harmodius and Aristogiton, suspecting on the very day, nay, at the very moment fixed on for the deed, that information had been conveyed to Happius by their accomplices, and concluded that he had been warned and did not attack him, yet not liking to be apprehended and risk their lives for nothing, fell upon Hipparchus near the temple of the daughter of Leos and slew him as he was arranging the Panathenaic procession. There are many other unfounded currents among the rest of Hellenes, even on matters of contemporary history, which have not obs would have not been obs obscured by time. For instance, there is the notion that the Lacedaemonian kings have two votes each, the fact being that they have only one, and that there is a company of Pitten, there being simple no such thing. So little pains do the vulgar take in the investigation of truth, accepting readily the first story that comes to hand. On the whole, however, the conclusions I have drawn from proofs quoted may, I believe, safely be relied on. Assuredly, they will not be dis disturbed either by the lays of a poet displaying the exaggeration of his craft, or by the compositions of the chroniclers that are attracted at, attractive to truth's expense. The suspects they treat of being out of reach of evidence, and of time having robbed most of them historical value, by enthroning them on the region of legend. 
Turning from these, we can rest satisfied with having proceeded upon the clearest data and having arrived at conclusions as exact as can be expected in mat matters of such antiquity. So, as you can see, it goes on um, that basically he's, 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 he's done his historical inquiry as careful as he can, sifting the evidence, looking at the best evidence that he can get and it's that kind of methodology that kind of attention to detail that when the gospels were being written that's the kind of historiography that these gospels were influenced by Um, Bochum says what Papias says does not agree with what the scholars say he says Papias belong roughly to speaking to the third Christian generation therefore to a generation that have been in contact with the first Christian generation the generation of the apostles he was personally equated with the daughters of Philip the evangelist Philip, who was one of the twelve, uh, which you can find in Acts chapter 21, 8 9. So, what um, Borkham is saying, I've laboured it quite a lot, is basically saying, Look, I think he's saying, um, We've, we've, I think what he's saying is we've not taken seriously the Gospels and we're not taken seriously people like Papias. When if we looked at their historical context and the language that they are using, they're quite clearly basing what they are doing on the way ancient historians wrote. He even notes that even the Gnostics claimed the same kind of methodology. Um, Irenaeus noted that the Gnostics claimed that they had oral transmission of information about Jesus. Obviously, we, uh, I don't when you look at those claims it's obvious that the claims are not founded um, but it does back up this point that even in even the Gnostics there was a general belief that if you were going to do history you had to do it in a certain way um, just an aside though the Gnostics were not even though they claimed to have got their ideas from uh, eyewitness accounts uh, is quite clear that that's a fabrication uh, in the Gnostics because when you compare their understanding of um, Jerusalem for example the Gnostic writers don't have any understanding what Jerusalem's like in the first century so uh, you know they're, they're not accurate so I suppose that if we're going to believe in eyewitness material, uh, that the fact that we, that people are saying that this is eyewitness material, it has to have some kind of historical veracity and consistency. Uh, this is all on page 33. He notes on page 34, James D. Dunn regards history as memory and eyewitness, a collective memory. Just a, a, an aside there. Okay, that's uh, pay up to page 35. Um, we'll finish off Borkham. Um. Hi folks, this is Jake. Hope you're okay today. We're looking at Jesus and the Eyewitnesses by Richard Borkham. 
the Gospels as eyewitness testimony 2006 um, we're, we're looking at some really heavy duty scholarship and that's what I hope to do on this site is we'll be looking at anything that about historical Jesus studies or anything that can strengthen our faith with good scholarship uh, this is what this channel is all about <coughs> and we're looking at a book uh, that I read that I found a very help from one of the top scholars in this field of historical Jesus studies now in uh, Bokum's book he mentions um, uh, Polybius um, and he quotes uh, on page 10 um, Bayer, uh, Bayer Skog as uh, an academic scholar Uh, he, he writes, having established the key role of the eyewitness testimony in ancient historiography, uh, Byron Scott argues that a similar role must have been played in the formation of the gospel tradition. Page 10. Uh, Polybius uh, is one historian. Um, um, Polybius was a Greek historian. Uh, we'll just get uh, some information here. Um, just get some information here. Uh, I've, I've studied this this writer, uh, but I, I haven't got my notes. I don't unless they're somewhere else. So. Uh, yeah, Polybius is an ancient Greek um, historian noted for his work, The Histories, which covered the period of 264 to 1646, 146 BC in detail. Um, Polybius was born in Arcadia around 200 BC. He was the son of Lycratas, a Greek politician, and became cavalry commander of the Achaean, Achaean Leagues. His father's opposition to Roman control of Macedonia resulted in his imprisonment. Polybius was then deported to Rome, where Lucius Aemilius Paulus employed him to tutor his two sons. Polybius had the opportunity to return to Macedonia in 152 BC. This is Wikipedia. Sorry for this. I have studied. Uh, Polybius primary source material not just Wikipedia um, see what I can get Um, so you can get um, we'll just look at the Greek Polybius histories yep we've got it here so Right, this is a uh, this is uh, how he writes. He, my history begins. This is the starting point of history. The history. This is in uh, this is in. Um, so this he 
he writes uh, in his histories had the prayers of history been passed over by former chronicles it would perhaps have been incumbent upon me to urge the choice and special study of records of this sort as the readiest means men can have of correcting their knowledge of the past but my predecessors have not been sparing in this respect they have all begun and ended so to speak by enlarging on this theme asserting again and again that the study of history is in the truest, truest sense an education and a training for political life that the most instructive or rather the only method of learning to bear with dignity the vicissitudes of fortune is to recall the catastrophes of others it is evident therefore that no one need think it is duty to repeat what has been said by many and said well that's just a little bit of uh, Polybius histories uh, just to get some primary source material so we're not doing shoddy work um, but the point is if you read Polybius this is the point sorry for labouring this uh, let's just buy Skog buy Skog Borkham quotes him having established the key role of eyewitness testimony in ancient historiography um, Byerskog argues that a similar role must have been in the formation of the gospel tradition so here's the point what uh, some thinkers historians did is they looked at Palabius and they saw that Palabius when you read his histories he goes on uh, midway through his book he talks about if you're going to be a good historian he chastises bad historians if you're going to be a good historian you need to go and talk to eyewitnesses and so if there was a battle in your time and you wanted to write about it as a historian you were expected to go to the scene and talk to the people who, who, who would have been there and this was standard practice amongst ancient historians uh, as especially after the time of Polybius because he influenced this uh, kind of writing so what that means is when we come to the Gospels um, for example if we come to uh, the Gospel of Luke He says, for as much, chapter 1, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things that are most surely believed among us, even so they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitness and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all these things, the very first to write unto thee in order most excellent Theophilus. So, when we read that, it's actually very, if, if not exactly the same the way Polybius, Polybius would see how to write history so what that means when we're reading the Gospels we look at it in its historical context the Gospel writers are writing as history they're using the typical methods that ancient Greek and Roman historians would use that puts a big question on coming at the Gospels as if they're they're uh, just myth because they're not the 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 they're being written as serious um, historical material as a testimony to the life of Jesus, and this is verified when we look at ancient writing, ancient historical writing. We'll get onto more of this. Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope you're okay today. We're looking at Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, the Gospel as Eyewitness Testimony, Richard Borkham, 2006, Erdman. He writes on page 10, The Gospel narratives are the synthesis of history and story of oral history and eyewitness and the interpretation and narrating process of an author by a uh, Byer Scoggs page 10 that's who he's quoting so basically um, what that means is that completely smashes the idea that the gospels 
uh, material, historical material that were done by uh, anonymous communities that were just mythological or that over a long period of time developed by a community of writers. What uh, Borkham is proposing is no early on there were authoritative people who had an understanding of the life and death of Jesus. They passed this information on. It was their interpretation. But it was written up by one author. That gave the perspective of that material. And so we see that in Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Each had, was an author had and wrote as an author and we can see that as we read the, the Gospels uh, Borkham writes the ancient historians know that first hand insider testimony gave access to truth that could not have been otherwise though not uncritical they were willing to trust this eyewitness information for the sake of the unique access they gave to the truth of the events. A remarkable thing about ancient historiography of the time that we just looked at of the Greek historian is they, if you read um, uh, Polybius, this is in his history. Um, He goes, my history begins in the 140th Olympiad. The events from which it starts are these in Greece, what is called the social war. Um, there is an analogy between the plan of my history and the marvellous spirit of the age which I have to deal. Just as fortune made almost all the affairs of the world incline in one direction and forced them to converge upon one and the same point. So it is my task as a historian to put before my readers a compendious view of the part played by fortune in bringing about the general catastrophe. It was this peculiarity which originally challenged my attention. Um, let's just get... Uh, About this, we'll get this. What I'm doing is just getting some quotes of Plebius on history. Flavius, if history is deprived of the truth, we are left with nothing but an idle and profitable tale. That's Flavius. The point um, this is really significant, uh, and Palabius, you if you read Palabius histories, uh, it's right about the middle of the book. But it's described exactly as Borkum uh, states it. Borkum says the ancient his 
historians nor the first hand insider testimony gave access to the truth that could not have been otherwise and when you read Polybius um, you get this feeling you get this feeling that actually unless we get eyewitness material this eyewitness material for a battle gives us a unique access to that battle a unique truth that we would not have otherwise and the thought that comes to my mind is when we're looking at the life of Jesus why as modern historians don't we have that view of eyewitness material eyewitness material and history the eyewitness material gives you a unique access to the understanding of the event I think that what's happened is over because we had rank and we had historians from that time trying to give us objective history and it's more trying to be scientific and so that often would negate the individual accounts of historical event maybe this modernistic perspective of history uh, has been influ too influential and I know there are trends in history where that modernistic understanding of this we, we're going to get objective history and the denigrating of eyewitness material um, that the trends have changed that there is a movement away from that to more seeing that individuals and communities and their eyewitness testimony is is, is is now being seen as important and has been for some time um, but I do think there is a truth that as historians people, we have missed and that is to say that eyewitness material does give you a unique access into history and I think the ancient historians had something there that we have lost as modern people and so um, if there was this wide held belief by ancient historians that eyewitness material gives you, gives you a unique truth into history then when the gospel writers are writing Matthew, Mark, Luke and John they would have that in their mind and that's what the perspective that they were writing from. Um, Plabius uses the word inquire. It's a Greek, it's a judicial term. These kind of Greek words like I inquired, this was a technical term used for by historians that they used in their language in the ancient times in how they expounded history they inquired that Greek word had a judicial understanding of investigation and looking at eyewitness material Th that word inquired was a technical Greek historian's word and people like Papias um, around about 111 AD maybe a little bit later they were using the same kind of technical Greek words that the Greek historians were using and so in other words what we're seeing is right across the board not only in the Gospel of Luke not only before the life of Jesus with Greek historians you got before the life of Jesus Greek historians you got the Gospel of Luke and after after the Gospel writers uh, in the early late first century and early second century when Christian thinkers and writers are writing they have this mindset that Polybius has about the importance of 
eyewitness material that it gives you a unique access to historical inquiry what this tells you is I suppose what it tells you is they took it very seriously they took eyewitness testimony very seriously and so when we're reading the Gospels we should take them more seriously it doesn't mean say as a skeptic you'll accept it all but if people have invested their lives in writing these works because they believe it's based on eyewitness material then we have to take that seriously and which doesn't say we have to take it on board uncritically but the days of saying oh it's all myth Jesus is a myth and Jesus didn't rise from the dead and it's all myth you can't just dismiss it like that you've got to engage with the material and I'll ask any skeptic today or even any Christian have you engaged with the Gospels and have you taken them seriously as eyewitness material and what will that teach you about either if you're a Christian your faith or you as a skeptic Hi folks, this is Jake, Holy OK Today. We're looking at uh, Richard Borkham, Jesus and the Eyewitness Gospels as Testimony, Richard Borkham, 2006, Erdman. And um, Borkham writes, uh, Bochum writes a, a bit about Papias um, and we'll just get a bit of information about Papias. These are translated by uh, Lightfoot and uh, preserved in Irenaeus against all heresies. The blessings thus foretold belongs undoubtedly. This is preserved in Irenaeus against all against heresies, five three three to three four. Uh, it says fragment one uh, translated by J.B. Lightfoot edited by Reverend Daniel Jennings um, the blessings thus foretold belongs undoubtedly to the times of the kingdom when the righteous shall rise from the dead and reign when to creation renewing freed from bondage shall produce a wealth uh, of food of all kinds uh, from the dew of heaven and from fatness of the earth of the elders who saw John the disciple of the Lord relate that they had heard from him how the Lord used to teach concerning those times and to say the days will come in which vines shall grow each having ten thousand shoots on each shoot branches on each branch again ten thousand twigs and each twig ten thousand clusters and clusters ten thousand grapes and each grape when pressed shall yield five and twenty measures of wine and when any of the saints shall have taken hold of one of their clusters, another shall cry, I am a better cluster, and take me. Bless the Lord through me. Likewise also a grain of wheat shall produce ten thousand heads, and every head shall have ten thousand grains, and every grain ten thousand and five flour, and bright and clean, and the other fruits, seed and the grass shall produce a similar portions. And all the animals, animals, using these fruits which are products of the soil shall become in their turn peaceable and harmonious obedient to man in all subjection these things papias he was a hearer of john the companion of polycarp and an ancient worthy witness in writing in the fourth of his books of there are five books composed by him and he added saying 
But these things are credible to them that believe. And when Judas the traitor did not believe and asked, How shall such gross be accomplished by the Lord? He relates that the Lord said, They shall see who shall come to these times. Fragment 2, preserved by Eusebius in um, Preserved in Eusebius of Caesarea's Church History Five books of Papias are extant which bear the title Exposition of Oracles of the Lord of these, Irenaeus also makes mention as the only works written by him. The following words, These things Papias, he was a hearer of John and companion of Polycarp, an ancient worthy witness in writing in the fourth of his books, for there are five books composed by him so far, Irenaeus. Yet Papias himself, in the preface to his discourses, certainly does not declare that he himself was a hearer and an eyewitness of the holy apostles, but he shows by the language which he uses that he received the matters of faith, of the faith from those who were their friends. But I will not scruple also to give a place, quote, for along with my interpretation to everything that I learnt carefully and remembered carefully in the past time from the elders guaranteeing its truth. For like the many, I did not take pleasure in those who have so very much to say, but in those who teach the truth, nor in those who relate foreign commandments, but in those who record such as were given from the law to the faith and are derived from the truth itself. And again, on any occasion, when a person came in my way who had been a follower of the elders, I would inquire about the discourse of the elders, what was said by Andrew or Peter or Philip or by Thomas or James or John or Matthew or any other of the Lord's disciples, and what Aristion and the elder John, the disciples of the Lord, say. For I did not think that I could get so much profit from the contents of books as from the utterances of a living and abiding voice. End of quote. Here it is worthwhile to observe that he twice enumerates the name of John. The first he mentions in connection with Peter and James and Matthew and the rest of the apostles. Evidently, the meaning, evidently meaning the evangelist, but the other John he mentions after an internal in class with other outside the number of the apostles placing Ariston before him, and is distinctly calls him an elder, so that he hereby makes it quite evident that the statement is true who say that there were two persons of that name in Asia, and that there are two tombs in Ephesus, each of which even now is called the tomb of the important to notice this, for it is probable that it was the second if one will not admit that it was the first revelation which is ascribed by name to John. Pius, of whom we are now speaking, confesses that he had received the words of the apostle from those who had followed them, but says that he himself, he was himself a hearer of Ariston and the elder John. At all events, he mentions them frequently by name, but besides their records, their traditions in his writings, so much for these points, which I trust have not been usually adduced. It is worthwhile, however, to add to the words of Papias given above other passages for him, in which he records some other wonderful events, likewise having come down to him by tradition. That Philip, the apostle, resided in Heraplas with his daughters, has been already stated, but how Papias, the contemporary, relates that he had heard a marvellous tale from the daughters of Philip, must be noted here. For he relates that in, a, in his time a man rose from the dead, and again he gives other wonderful stories about justice, he was surnamed Barsabas, how he drank a deadly poison, yet by the grace of the Lord suffered no inconvenience. Of this justice, the book of Acts records that after the extension of the Saviour, the holy apostles put him forward with Matthias and prayed for the right choice, in place of the traitor Judas, that should make their number complete. This passage is somewhat as follows, and they put for, forward to Joseph called Barsabas, Barsabas who was surnamed Justus and Matthias, and they prayed and said, and a quote, end of quote. The same writer has recorded other notices as having come down to him from oral tradition, certain strange parables of the Saviour and teaching of his, and other statements of rather mythical character, among which he says that there will be a period of some 10,000 years after the resurrection, 
and that the kingdom of Christ will be set up in a material form on this earth. These ideas, I suppose, he got through a misunderstanding of the apostolic accounts, not perceiving that the things recorded there in figures were spoken by the mystical. Let's see how much time I've got. For he evidently was a man of very mean capacity, as one may be judged from his own statements, yet it was owing to him that so many church fathers after him adopted a like opinion, urging their own support the antiquity of the man, as for instance Irenaeus, however, else they were also declared that they held like views. Pius also gives his own work other accounts of the words of the Lord on the authority of Ariston, who has been mentioned above. The traditions of the elders john to these we refer to the curious and for our present purpose we will merely add to this words which have been quoted above a tradition which has been set forth through these sources concerning mark who wrote the gospel and the elder said this also mark having become the interpreter of peter wrote down accurately everything that he remembered without however recording in order what was either said or done by christ neither did he hear the word Lord nor did he follow him but afterwards as I said attended Peter who adopted his instructions to the needs of his ears but had no design of giving a connected account of the Lord's oracle so then Mark made no mistake Barley thus wrote down some things as he remembered them for he made it his one care not to omit anything that he heard or set down any false statement therein such then end of quote is the account given by Papias concerning Mark. But concerning Matthew, the following statement is made by him. So then Matthew composed the oracle in the Hebrew language, and each one interpreted them as he could. The same writer employed testimonies from the first epistle of John, and likewise from that of Peter. And he has related another story about a woman accused of many sins before the Lord, which the gospel according to the Hebrews contains. So what's the significance of uh, Papias? Well, the significance of Papias is that uh, he's very important in telling us about the gospel traditions, who who wrote the gospels, um, etc. But Papias's uh, testimony was just dismissed by the foreign critics, the Boltman scholars. Um, and it, it was just dismissed. But now, Balcom is saying we need to take Papias seriously. Because he, he did want to look at eyewitness material as honestly and faithfully as he could. He might have made mistakes, collected stories that were, weren't true. But he collected, he tried to collect stories that were true based on this methodology and if that's the case we can look at what papyrus says and find some historical kernel um, and for example papyrus verifies that the gospels were very early on accepted throughout the ancient world um, as authoritative so taking papyrus if you noticed in the uh, reading, um, went to talk to Philip's daughters. You know, it was incumbent on him on him to find out about what the eyewitnesses were saying and to investigate. And he's using the same methodology as Greek historians. So that means when we're reading Papias or we're reading some of the early church writers. We have to take them more seriously in that they were trying to be faithful um, to what they believed uh, were the eyewitness material. Um, that doesn't mean to say we accept what they say uncritically. It doesn't mean to say that they, they didn't make mistakes. Papias um, probably made mistakes in his historical thinking and writing. Um, but what it does show is how the form critics and how the whole scholarly world can just dismiss papyrus 
as irrelevant in the study of the Gospels and the importance of the Gospels about the life of Christ and now another major scholar Barkham pushing back and saying no the trend has gone too far the pious is actually very important in this discussion actually tells us some very important things and not only tells us some very important things his methodology is extremely important and that means we can find out things about the gospels and the value of the gospels the importance of the gospels the content of the gospels from papias's time we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this in more detail Hi folks, this is Jake. Hope you're okay today. We're looking at uh, Jesus and the Eyewitness Gospels. Uh, as Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, the Gospels as Eyewitness Testimony. Richard Borkham, 2006, Erdman. And we're on page 6. He writes, This is the assumption that the traditions about Jesus, his acts and his words, pass through a long process of oral tradition in the early Christian communities. Um, and the writers of the Gospels only at a later stage of this process so sorry I couldn't read one of the words and I think we had re-edited or so this is the assumption that the tradition this is form criticism he's on about form criticism this is the assumption that traditions about Jesus his acts and his words passed through a long process of oral tradition in the early Christian communities that the writers of the Gospels uh, were at a later, later stage of this process page 6 I'll read that again because uh, I got interrupted with the telephone this is the assumption for criticism that the traditions about Jesus, his acts and his words passed through a long process of oral tradition in the early Christian communities and re-edited I put it in because I can't read my word there I think it's edited the writers of the Gospels only at a later stage of this process page 6 page 7 if the four critics are right, the disciples must have been translated to heaven immediately after the resurrection. Uh, that's J. Barkham, who quotes uh, Vincent Taylor, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, one of the uh, things about um, historical Jesus studies is form criticism, um, and we'll get. We'll, was which was um, mainly this guy uh, Rudolf Bultmann was the main guy for this and uh, we may look at him at a later date uh, some of the book some of these essays and writings uh, but Rudolf Bultmann was influential in developing form criticism and basically what form criticism said is that um, the gospels are obviously late late literature which have been developed over a long period of time of historical development uh, due to um, anonymous communities who've taken the oral tradition of the disciples or whoever knew Jesus and changed that oral tradition uh, and it became a mishmash of, of uh, myth and fact and these communities produced uh, the Gospels which are just edited bits of this tradition but the, the point here in page 7 where Barkham quotes Vincent Taylor if the form critics are right the disciples must have been translated to heaven immediately after the resurrection what Vincent Taylor uh, humorously is saying there is look this you this um, anonymous editing of communities that would mean that the disciples who lived in Jesus time and the disciples after 
the second the next generation of disciples after them was there were specific people right we had the apostle paul and then we had timothy we had uh, peter and then we had mark etc and uh, we had paul and his friend luke in other words there were key individual people who were custodians of the tradition of Jesus and form criticism is basically saying that these individuals just must have disappeared and what Borkham is saying is saying no wait a minute no the, the way actually the way oral tradition and the way eyewitness material is, is passed on it's actually often passed on by key authoritative individuals who then pass it on to other key authoritative individuals and this is diametrically opposed to the Boltman project and what that means is it if that's the case if that's how it happened then it opens the door to saying well maybe if there were these keys in individuals and they existed and they were authoritative of the tradition of passing on the life of Jesus then maybe there's actually more eyewitness material and less mythological development here than we've given the Gospels credit for that's the beauty of what Borkham and other scholars in this area are bringing to us and it, and it has direct relevance against the skeptics uh, the atheists and the many mithraists and Jesus mythers out there who said Jesus is a myth it, it, it completely demolishes a lot of skepticism and a lot of um, attacks on the Christian faith because what was what it does is, is actually bring this theory of eyewitness material brings us closer to the historical Jesus and verifies more the Gospels and we'll get into more of this Hi folks, we're looking at uh, Dr. Borkham's book, uh, Jesus and the Eyewitness, uh, the Gospels as Eyewitness Text, Domini Richard Borkham, 2006, Erdmund, and we're on page 5 now. He says, it is true that, that a powerful trend in modern development of critical historical philosophy and methods finds trusting the testimony a stumbling block in the way of the historian's autonomous access to that she or he can verify independently but it is also rather neglected fact that all history like all knowledge relies on testimony page five yeah there's been a, a double standard within scholarship i think um and i think that the theory of understanding history needs to change within the academic world uh when it comes to historical jesus studies um, we'll just deconstruct this it is true that a powerful trend in modern development of critical historical philosophy and method finds trusting the testimony a stumbling block in the way of historians autonomous access to the to, to truth that she or he can verify independently now it's interesting that ancient historians which we'll get into uh, had great store in, in eyewitness material uh, also there has been a trend uh, between uh, macro and micro understanding of history you see there's been a big emphasis all over for a, a long time since rank uh, historian uh, on macro history that is looking at history on a on a big big compartment uh, looking at history from uh, general perspectives or politicians perspectives but there's also uh, since the 60s been more of an emphasis on a micro level of understanding of history and that is to say that um, we look at what ordinary people are thinking what it, what are they saying and we take their material their eyewitness material their stories their diaries so what I'm saying is that maybe this reluctance on modern historiography 
of not wanting to take eyewitness material seriously is because it's been saddled with this kind of macro understanding of history without realizing the need to listen to the testimonies of individuals and to learn from what those are saying. I understand that historians study diaries and letters and, and all the rest of it. But why is it that we don't allow that kind of historical work inform us about the historical Jesus studies? Why are we prejudiced? Maybe it's because there's been a running battle for the last 200 years between secularism and, and church and there's been a vying of power of wanting to control public space part of that is to undermine Christianity's intellectual foundations and one of those is the Gospels and the New Testament is based on eyewitness material and so to disparage that would also to undermine Christianity but I think as academics you need to come back and realize that this is not acceptable that you you're not here to play power games you're here to inst uh, to do historical study uh, in a more fair way as sh in the best and fair way that you can and then he says that always that rather but it is also rather neglected fact that all history like all knowledge relies on testimony and so therefore there's the rub that we can't just ignore the fact that if we're going to do history it's ultimately based on testimony we've got to be consistent where does that leave us in terms of Christianity well I think Balkan's project is saying what we, we've got to get back to a fair practice of history and a serious commitment to seeing what eyewitness material there is and what we can learn from that material <clears throat> hi folks this is Jake hope you're okay today it's good to see you and uh, it's good to be with you today um, I've started a new channel um, basically I've studied the historical Jesus uh, studies for about 10 years and um, the last year it's been quite intense I did a lot of study because I had debates with atheists and um, I have a degree in theology I've studied at master's level um, and um, in theology uh, specialising in postmodern uh, studies and uh, various religions such as Islam and the reason why I want to do this channel is I have you can't see here but I have piles and piles of study notes that I just want to get out to the public to inform them about historical Jesus studies uh, to strengthen people's faith because this actually helps people who to strengthen their faith and also to challenge skeptics uh, so I hope it's going to be a blessing uh, I hope that people find it a good resource and uh, I hope it shows um, a side to me that people don't realize uh, a scholarly side to me that that I have uh, as well but above all I just hope that it brings glory to Christ and uh, brings him honor so we got thousands of notes to get on today so without further ado we will uh, get on making the video so come before the Lord Lord <coughs> we come before you today and we ask for your forgiveness and cleansing and father I pray that you will bless these videos and I pray that they be a blessing to people and I pray that they would bring you glory and honor in Jesus name Amen. I pray people will get saved and people will, people will come to know you as Lord and Saviour Amen Okay we're looking at um, 
uh, a series of videos now which will be a long series uh, and we're looking at a very important book and it's uh, in historical Jesus studies in modern times and it's Jesus and the Eyewitness uh, the Gospels as Eyewitness Testimony by Richard Borkham 2006 so we're going to go through his his book um, and um, I hope that you find um, the quotes and um, it's published by Erdman okay so it's Richard Borkham 2006 published by Erdman and it's Jesus and the eyewitness gospels eyewitness testimony <coughs> he writes all history meaning all that history is right all historiography is an extricable combination of fact and interpretation the empirically observable and the <coughs> and the invented or constructed meaning page three so I just want to talk about history and interpretation of history history every historian is biased there will be people who will say well Christianity has the Gospels and the Gospels are biased therefore we can't read the Gospels and this is just complete misnomer the fact of the matter is every one of us and historians were all biased when we look at history to not acknowledge that fact is to be intellectually dishonest does that mean we can't we can't know history no it, we can know history we can know what history means we can understand history Josephus was biased but we can know history objectively through him as we read we just have to filter our objectivity and fil uh, our, our um, bias and we have to filter his bias but it can be done but we have to be aware that we all come to the table with biased lenses if we don't acknowledge that we're not being intellectually honest hi folks this is Jason hope you're okay today we're looking at Jesus and the eyewitnesses the gospel as eyewitness testimony Richard Ball from 2006 Erdman. he writes on page 10 the gospel narratives are the synthesis of history and story of oral history and eyewitness and the interpretation and narrating process of an author by uh, Byer Scoggs page 10 that's who he's quoting so basically um, what that means is that completely smashes the idea that the Gospels are material, historical material that were done by um, anonymous communities that were just mythological or that over a long period of time developed by a community of writers what uh, Borkham is proposing is no early on there were authoritative people who had an understanding of the life and death of Jesus they passed this information on it was their interpretation but it was written up by one author that gave the perspective of that material and so we see that in Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John each had, was an author had and wrote as an author and we can see that as we read the, the Gospels uh, Borkham writes the ancient historians know that first hand insider testimony gave access to truth that could not have been otherwise though not uncritical they were willing to trust this eyewitness information for the sake of the unique access they gave to the truth of the events a remarkable thing about ancient historiography of the time that we just looked at of the Greek historian is they if you read um, uh, Polybius this is in his history um, he goes my history begins in the 140th Olympiad the events from which it starts are these in Greece what is called the social war 
There is an analogy between the plan of my history and the marvellous spirit of the age which I have to deal, just as fortune made almost all the affairs of the world incline in one direction and force them to converge upon one and the same point. So it is my task as a historian to put before my readers a compendious view of the part played by fortune in bringing about the general catastrophe. It was this peculiarity which originally challenged my attention. Um, Just get Like this, we'll get this. What I'm doing is just getting some quotes of Plebius on history. Flavius, if history is deprived of the truth, we are left with nothing but an idle and profitable tale. That's Flavius. The point um, this is really significant, uh, and Palabius, you if you read Palabius histories, uh, it's right about the middle of the book. But it's described exactly as Borkum uh, states it. Bochum says the ancient his historians know that first hand insider testimony gave access to the truth that could not have been otherwise. And when you read Palabius, um, you get this feeling, you get this feeling that actually unless we get eyewitness material, this eyewitness material for a battle gives us a unique access to that battle, a unique truth that we would not have otherwise and the thought that comes to my mind is when we're looking at the life of Jesus why as modern historians don't we have that view of eyewitness material eyewitness material and history the eyewitness material gives you a unique access to the understanding of the event. I think that what's happened is over, because we had rank and we had historians from that time trying to give us objective history, and it's more trying to be scientific, and so that often would negate the individual accounts of historical event. Maybe this modernistic perspective of history uh, has been influ too influential and I know there are trends in history where that modernistic understanding of this we, we're going to get objective history and the denigrating of eyewitness material um, 
that the trends have changed, that there is a movement away from that to more seeing that individuals and communities and their eyewitness testimony is, 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 is now being seen as important and has been for some time. Um, but I do think there is a truth that as historians people, we have missed and that is to say that eyewitness material does give you a unique access into history and I think the ancient historians had something there that we have lost as modern people and so um, if there was this wide held belief by ancient historians that eyewitness material gives you, gives you a unique truth into history then when the gospel writers are writing Matthew, Mark, Luke and John they would have that in their mind and that's what the perspective that they were writing from um, Plabius uses the word inquire it's a Greek it's a judicial term these kind of Greek words like I inquired this was a technical term used for by historians that they used in their language in the ancient times in how they expounded history they inquired that Greek word had a judicial understanding of investigation and looking at eyewitness material Th that word inquired was a technical Greek historian's word and people like Papias um, around about 111 AD maybe a little bit later they were using the same kind of technical Greek words that the Greek historians were using and so in other words what we're seeing is right across the board not only in the Gospel of Luke not only before the life of Jesus with Greek historians you got before the life of Jesus Greek historians you got the Gospel of Luke and after after the Gospel writers uh, in the early late first century and early second century when Christian thinkers and writers are writing they have this mindset that Polybius has about the importance of eyewitness material that it gives you a unique access to historical inquiry what this tells you is I suppose what it tells you is they took it very seriously they took eyewitness testimony very seriously and so when we're reading the Gospels we should take them more seriously it doesn't mean say as a skeptic you'll accept it all but if people have invested their lives in writing these works because they believe it's based on eyewitness material then we have to take that seriously and which doesn't say we have to take it on board uncritically but the days of saying oh it's all myth Jesus is a myth and Jesus didn't rise from the dead and it's all myth you can't just dismiss it like that you've got to engage with the material and I'll ask any skeptic today or even any Christian have you engaged with the Gospels and have you taken them seriously as eyewitness material and what will that teach you about either if you're a Christian your faith or you as a skeptic I folks this is Jake hope you're okay today we're looking at Jesus and the eyewitnesses by Richard Borkham uh, the Gospels as eyewitness testimony 2006 um, we're, we're looking at some really heavy duty scholarship and that's what I hope to do on this site is we'll be looking at anything that about historical Jesus studies or anything that can strengthen our faith with good scholarship uh, this is what this channel is all about <coughs> and we're looking at a book 
uh, that I read that I found a very help of one of the top scholars in this field of historical Jesus studies. Now, in uh, Balkan's book, he mentions um, uh, Polybius, um, and he quotes uh, on page ten um, Bayer uh, Bayer Skog as uh, an academic scholar. Uh, he, he writes, having established the key role of the eyewitness testimony in ancient historiography, uh, Byers Scog argues that a similar role must have been played in the formation of the gospel tradition. Page 10. Uh, Polybius uh, is one historian. Um, um, Polybius was a Greek historian. Uh, we'll just get uh, some information here. Um, just get some information here. Uh, I've, I've studied this this writer, uh, but I, I haven't got my notes. I don't unless they're f somewhere else. Or Uh, yeah, Polybius is an ancient Greek um, historian noted for his work, The Histories, which covered the period of 264 to 1646, 146 BC in detail. Um, Polybius was born in Arcadia around 200 BC. He was the son of Lycritas, a Greek politician, and became cavalry commander of the Achaean, Achaean Leagues. His father's opposition to Roman control of Macedonia resulted in his imprisonment. Polybius was then deported to Rome, where Lucius Aemilius Paulus employed him to tutor his two sons. Polybius had the opportunity to return to Macedonia in 152 BC. This is Wikipedia. Sorry for this. I have studied... Uh, Polybius primary source material not just Wikipedia um, see what I can get uh, Um, so, you can get, um, we'll just look at the Greek, Polybius histories, yep, we've got it here, so. Right, this is a uh, this is uh, how he writes. He, my history begins. This is the starting point of history. The history. This is in uh, this is in. Um, See what I Sorry about this. You write uh, in his histories. Had the praise of history been passed over by former chronicles, it would perhaps have been incumbent upon me to urge the choice and special study of records of this sort as the readiest means men can have of correcting their knowledge of the past. But my predecessors have not been sparing in this respect. 
They've all begun and ended, so to speak, by enlarging on this theme, asserting again and again that the study of history is in the truest, truest sense an education and a training for political life. That the most instructive, or rather the only method of learning to bear with dignity the vicissitudes of fortune is to recall the catastrophes of others. It is evident, therefore, that no one need think it is duty to repeat what has been said by many and said well. That's just a little bit of uh, Polybius histories, uh, just to get some primary source material, so we're not doing shoddy work. Um, but the point is, if you read Polybius, this is the point. Sorry for labouring this. Uh, let's just buy Skog, uh, buy Skog, Borkum quotes him, having established the key role of eyewitness testimony in ancient historiography. Um, Weierskog argues that a similar role must have been in the formation of the gospel tradition. So here's the point. What uh, some thinkers, historians did, is they looked at Palabius and they saw that Palabius, when you read his histories, he goes on uh, midway through his book. He talks about if you're going to be a good historian, he chastises bad historians. If you're going to be a good historian, you need to go and talk to eyewitnesses. And so, if there was a battle in your time, and you wanted to write about it as a historian, you were expected to go to the scene and talk to the people who, who, who would have been there. And this was standard practice amongst ancient historians. Uh, as especially after the time of Polybius, because he influenced this uh, kind of writing. So, what that means is, when we come to the Gospels, um, for example, if we come to uh, the Gospel of Luke, He says, for as much, chapter 1, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things that are most surely believed among us, even so they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitness and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all these things, the very first to write unto thee in order most excellent Theophilus. So, when we read that, it's actually very, if, if not exactly the same, the way... Polybius, Polybius would see how to write history. So what that means when we're reading the Gospels, we look at it in its historical context, the Gospel writers are writing as history. They're using the typical methods that ancient Greek and Roman historians would use. That puts a big question on coming at the Gospels as if they're they're uh, just myth because they're not the 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 they're being written a serious uh, historical material as a testimony to the life of Jesus, and this is verified when we look at ancient writing, ancient historical writing. We'll get onto more of this. <laughs> 